Welcome to episode three. Uh, So far, I'm very satisfied with how Culpable is going. It's allowed me to get a lot of things off my big, strong chest. And it's also a reminder that many of you will never say what you really think, even in private, much less in public. So again, this show is about ship fear, and I just want to encourage you to ship those thoughts. Ship them and see what happens. You might get canceled in this day and age, you might get killed, but what I've found to be true is that for every leftist you will piss off, a person on the other side will buy your course, sign up for your SaaS application, subscribe to your blog newsletter, or even watch your so well, stupid solo show. Uh, and you can interchange those words. Everyone on the right you piss off will you know, attract a leftist. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff. First, we've got the Twitter files, and then we've got things like teenage angst, achieving visions, solo founders, fundraising, getting involved, And finally, another tip for the boys. First off, Twitter files. If you don't know about the Twitter files, you are probably probably like a a nice, reasonable person, well-rounded. To summarize, what has become clear this week is that pricks working at Twitter for the last few years have become the sole arbiters of truth. They have been able to determine which facts about the universe you are allowed to know and which facts you are not allowed to consume or know. Uh, Elon Musk has made this super uh, clear. He's confirmed suspicions of basically millions of us that we've had over the last few years about Twitter's dirty practices. And really, we're just getting started. Twitter Files Part 2 dropped last night. Also very interesting proved that there are a lot of liars working at the Bluebird. I can't decide, here's my takeaway from all this, I can't decide if I would rather be alive now or during our last genius, Albert Einstein, who dedicated his life to building bombs that killed millions of Japanese people. Just kidding, it was a couple hundred thousand. So we'll keep you posted on the Twitter files, the Twitter files, because If you look at them, it's all caps. If things change. Next up, teenage angst. You know, those emo rock bands that we all listen to, my generation, that we listen to in high school. You know, I wanna illustrate really quickly. I think I'm gonna summarize emo bands with, with one lyric. Here we go. She saw me in the hallway, but didn't talk to me at math class. Every song is like that. Teenage angst, unrequited love. Teenagers don't really know what love is, but they think. Lust. And, you know, I was thinking about this music the other day because this was my favorite, my go-to genre. I actually just bought concert tickets to bands. I just bought Blink-182 tickets for the 2023 World Tour. I bought tickets to When We Were Young out in Vegas, which is going to be just a total emo, nostalgic fest. And I got to thinking that, you know, those bands we listened to, not our local bands, I was in one of those local bands that were all 16-year-olds, but the bands we listened to that made it, they were all dudes in their 20s. (laughs) singing about this stuff. I saw her in the hallway. She didn't talk to me in math class. And it got me thinking that either one of two things is true, and this is me being very generous here. Either those guys who are now in their 20s are so butthurt about not being cool in high school, they're so, or, and so they're still reliving it, sort of the same difference as the guy who was quote unquote cool, the football player who's reliving high school that they almost went to state. Either that or they are targeting these teenagers. Um, So it's either sad or just creepy. 
Now, does this change my behavior uh, in res with respect to emo music consumption? Absolutely not, because now I'm older and I get to relive high school uh, in a fun way for three minutes at a time and enjoy trying to relive the weird emotions I had back then. So I think emo is still great, but I am kind of looking at, you know, I'm kind of squinting at the proprietors of mainstream emo music. They were not like us. They were not like us, but they were targeting us. Make of that what you will. All right, next we've got achieving a vision. Let me put down this guitar. There's something, I had a CEO coach for a while and there's something he taught me. He said that at best, your team will do 70% of what you ask or they will do things that you ask, but like at 70% quality. Either way, there's some you know reasonable chunk of either work or quality of work that you're going to miss out on when you delegate it to other people. That's what he told me. And I've found that to sort of be a power law that is definitely true. I've hired and managed many different people uh, over the years at different projects. Um, and this happens because the people you hire might take shortcuts. They might argue with your vision. There's a too many chiefs, not enough Indians, or nowadays too many cooks in the kitchen. And uh, they're gonna argue. Uh, they could even be lazy. They could be temporarily lazy. They could be working three jobs. There's a subreddit for people who are overemployed who strategize how to have two jobs, how to have four jobs. It's a thing. And I think this is why militaries actually can be so powerful. It's not necessarily that the training, the military teaching you to shoot a gun, jump over an obstacle, is better than what you could do on your own or with YouTube. It's that they drill into your head absolute compliance and cooperation. And that's why even small squads of dudes in the military can just kill hundreds of armed enemies who aren't as well trained, who are under trained, because they have that absolute cooperation. So putting this all together, as this relates to us non-military folks, probably working in technology, is this, solo founders. Solo founders, we need to acknowledge, they achieve a lot, not as an exception, but as a rule. The common narrative with solo founders is that if a solo founder is making a lot of money, insert whatever amount of money is a lot for you, we say, you know, they're just a genius, they're an exception, how can one person do all of that? Uh, but it's really, to be honest, just about the opposite is true. Because this solo founder only directs themselves, all of the tasks that are in their brain, the things they want to achieve, their vision, they only direct themselves, which means that the daily tasks being completed are 100% to spec with how they wanted them completed and when they wanted them completed. So in the same way that a military has absolute compliance with every order, there's a chain of command, this is also the advantage of the solo founder. So I tell you this not to go out and stop being impressed or admiring solo founders, but to realize that they have a tool that your company with 10 times the employees doesn't have. They have military grade absolute cooperation. So what we all need is that. We don't necessarily need to be solo founders. We can have a team of five or a team of 50,000. What we want is to increase our percentage of compliance. And compliance is uh, maybe an icky word for some of you, but in the workplace, that's what you need. You're the one with the vision. If your people are not executing your vision, they have to go. And I would say this to employees as well. You can either execute your vision or you can execute someone else's. And that was a quote, I think. Just realize that you're either working on your dream or you're working on someone else's. And it was sort of suggested to say that you should never work on someone else's dream. But I would add to that that we don't always all have a dream. I haven't always had visions. They come and go. Things I really wanna achieve and that I'm actually motivated to achieve. Sometimes it's good to go into that employee mode and absorb and learn and get paid and stack, stack coin. Sometimes it's good to go achieve someone else's vision. So I'm gonna remove the negative connotation from that and just make it very plain. You can achieve your vision or someone else's and you need to make a choice. Which one are you working on? 
By the way, this episode is sponsored by, <laughs> just kidding, no one would ever sponsor this. <laughs> Fundraising. So recently, ish, ish, recently, I was in Portugal on a team retreat and uh, I was talking to someone there, an investor, I won't name names. We don't name names on this show unless I feel like it. And the investor, I asked them something about the strategy and they said they're making a real estate play, a real estate play. Now, if you don't, if you're not in this industry, investing, technology, apologies, uh, this will mean nothing to you. But if you're a founder or you've wanted to be a founder, if you've ever had coffee with an investor, you might have learned that it's a very bad idea to use the word play. <laughs> uh, because when you say, yeah, you know, I'm trying to raise money for this uh, blah, blah, blah play, it communicates to the investor that you're sort of just arbitraging a short-term opportunity, your heart is not in it, you've sort of made up your mind about this business based on maybe a spreadsheet. And the investors are usually gonna be turned off by that. Uh, to you or to the investor, you need to be dedicating 10 to 30 years of your life on this project. Calling it a play is frankly just disrespectful. The investor wants you to be totally dedicated. This should be your religion. Whereas to the investor, we can now acknowledge that they do think of each investment as a play. That's because you, the founder, are working on one thing for years. The investor treats you as an object. They are working on many of you. They are working with many different founders over the years. So to an investor, a play is a bet a bet, like a casino bet. You throw it down on black. You can afford to lose the money, hopefully, investors. Uh, but the games uh, we play, because the games we play with our spare money are bets. Meanwhile, founders are supposed to put all of their eggs in one basket. This is not a game, this is not a play, this is not a bet. This is your whole life and it has to work. So that's almost uh, not a policing uh, practice, exercise, but just a, a word of, Caution, uh, as you chat with investors, if that's something you wanna do, you have to choose your words carefully. Um, the same thing to them is not the same perception as it is to you. Next up, getting involved. I have nothing to say here um, besides one thing. If you do not wanna get involved in the place you live, and by involved, I mean in your local people, your town. You know, that can mean spending time in your town, literally in your town, uh, shopping at local businesses, getting to know your neighbor. If you're not interested in doing that, I'm going to argue that you're living in the wrong place. I've lived in many towns, really big towns. I've lived in New York City for years, San Francisco, I've spent a little bit of time in LA. I've lived in Seoul, Korea. I've been a digital nomad to three dozen countries. I've lived all over. I've lived in downtown Atlanta. And I gotta tell you, I didn't wanna get involved in any of those places. Not involved in that specific geography. I had friends, I had things I did. It didn't matter the geography though. Now in the town I live in, I want to be involved. I learned that the person who did my closing documents on my mortgage is the mayor of the town. I've been buying meat from a local farm. They're probably gonna come help me today, move my dead cow. I think my cow got pneumonia, so one of my, one of my bulls. So you gotta help me move my dead cow. Can't believe I'm saying those words. And I'm getting involved. Not because I want power or status or be the cool guy, but because it feels that I need to feels like the right thing to do. So I'm just gonna argue again, if you don't wanna get involved in the place you live, you're living in the wrong place. One more note. This one, just like episode two, I have a, a, a comment for the boys, women, stop watching, click to the cooking channel. Uh, I've been watching this dating show on YouTube and I would never, under any circumstance, watch a dating show However, my friends are producing this show and I helped invest in it on their Kickstarter. It was a whole thing. And uh, in the last episode, two of the people, a guy and a girl, they got to go on a little private boat ride as like a date away from all the other contestants. And they get into the boat, woman steps in, you know, from the dock into the boat, you know, hovering on the water. And then the guy steps in and he says, 
That was scary. <sighs> Men, do not ever tell a woman that something is scary. Part of your purpose on earth is to mitigate scary. Okay, so scary things exist, scary things happen. Men can be scared. Don't get it twisted, but do not ever tell a woman something was scary because you're removing, you're, you're depurposing yourself. Your purpose is to mitigate risk. All right, that's all I got for you. Meditate on this or pray if you have a God. I think we've talked about this before. Have a great weekend. See you next time. Thank you.